Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the September meeting of the Ottawa Centre RASC. Uh, I hope everyone's had a good summer, this being the final uh, meeting of the summer season. Uh, we've got a great program for you tonight. If my clicker works, the clicker's not working, Chris. Yes, it is. Oh, it is. Uh, I, I may be able to field a question for you. Uh, th that's not a question I'm going to be able to answer for you quickly, uh, <laughs> but perhaps uh, perhaps a topic for the break. I'm sure there's folks in here that uh, that might have an opinion on that. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, so we've got a great program for you uh, today. Um, so we've got some of our usual stuff with uh, Ottawa Skies. Uh, we've got a, a, an update on Astro Pontiac. Uh, Chuck is back to try to stump us again. If you recall, he had a quite a tricky question. Uh, last month, and I think the one that he's got this month is equally tricky, if not trickier. Uh, and then after the break, we've got uh, Simon back to give uh, his third presentation in his series on uh, origins of, uh, of uh, solar system, uh, and then followed by observations and other various announcements. Uh, so these are our new members uh, this month. Uh, welcome to the new members. We've had 42 new members so far in 2018. Something's up with my clicker. There we go. All right. Uh, so Gary Boyle's been busy doing uh, some media circuit there. Uh, here he is on the CBC, um, speaking about the uh, the Perseid meteors, and that photograph there is by Pierre Martin. Ah, yes, uh, Starfest uh, happened uh, last month, the first week of August there, and our very own Paul Kloninger uh, delivered a very interesting talk on uh, how to capture images in, uh, in photography. It was, it was a great talk, and congratulations for being selected for that, Paul. Oh, all right, Dave, take it away. The clicker's being a little finicky. Yeah, okay, I'm just to Okay, so let's take a look at the Ottawa skies for this month. I, I sent this uh, picture to Chris uh, just to prove I was in Australia last month at the, at the Sydney Observatory with my RESC jacket on. Okay, so let's take a look at the, uh, the moon phases for September. So full moon, also known as the harvest moon, is on September the 24th, and we have our equinox on September the 23rd. In terms of uh, special observations this month, we have Comet 21P, uh, Jacobini Zinner, and this is its uh, path across the, uh, the sky. Uh, best bet is to just Google Comet 21P, September 2018. There's lots of charts up there to show you w what its path is. So Mercury is uh, not visible this month. Venus is visible the first half of the month and uh, then we won't see it for a while. And Mars is visible all night. It was quite bright there the other night. Jupiter is visible the first part of the evening. Saturn is visible all evening. Uranus is visible all night. And Neptune is visible all night and it's at opposition, which means it's closest to the Earth on September the 7th. That's tonight. Maybe we'll finish early and go out and try to find that one. Because our next meeting occurs after this event, I, I thought well, I'll, I'll throw this in now. So you've got the Draken in its meteor shower, uh, October 8th and 9th. And uh, the good thing is there's no moon, so it should be excellent viewing for that. And there's our cartoon of the month. Thank you. Alrighty. 
Thank you, Dave. All right, up next we've got uh, Stefan Pape with his uh, Astro Pontiac update. Hi everybody, thank you again for um, hosting me uh, for another uh, update on the Astro Pontiac project. Uh, tonight I've come to uh, speak about uh, our, our basically our physical presence on the observing field in Luskville because I was here a couple of months ago and, and uh, was able to so to tell you a little bit about the planetarium that we just acquired. So this is our 10 by 14 um, uh, shed that was built mainly on a uh, sky shed design with a few, um, with a few modifications by our uh, contractor. We, we were lucky to find a contractor that wasn't just a great builder but also had a love of astronomy. So, uh, so he, uh, he, he put a lot of thought into sort of making, uh, making everything just right for the type of observing we're doing. Um, so uh, this, is, this is the shed in action on the night of uh, the Perseids. So we've had a couple of uh, events. First we had, our, on our first night we had um, Mars and Company uh, and that one, uh, it, we had uh, quite a few uh, observers, many from uh, Ra uh, Rask coming out as well and not as many uh, visitors from the general public but that was okay because it was our first night and we were uh, just getting used to um, uh, just getting used to the equipment. We have, you, you'll see that um, because we're dealing with the public, we decided to go with a bit of a higher door frame and higher walls, but we still managed to have a decent view with the telescope of, uh, of the ecliptic and uh, also, uh, we just, because it's a Schmidt cast grain that's on, uh, the, on the mount, we're able to sort of play with the angle of the, um, of the eyepiece so that uh, e even sort of like younger people don't have to do too much climbing. Uh, my, my daughter Madeline, who's getting a little bit up there, uh, she, did, uh, she was able to observe with us for the evening and uh, she didn't have to use the step stools once and of course the younger kids have to. Uh, this was a photo uh, of our evening with the Perseid uh, meteor shower uh, and I, I think you know when um, when you don't have a picture it's like it didn't even happen uh, because everything is just sort of ephemeral you, you know you have the evening and then it goes by uh, but we had a wonderful uh, amateur photographer who uh, just was passing by for the evening, uh, James Peltzer, who takes, uh, who takes pictures all around Ottawa and Gatineau, and uh, he put this one together for us, and, and I think it really captures the spirit of the evening, because we put out the chairs and just let the sky speak for itself, and then we um, have people coming in and out uh, of the observatory to maybe look at planets or whatever. Uh, as, as we pull something new into the eyepiece. And in that evening, uh, for the Perseids, we had about 30 people come out. So we'll be having a few other uh, planned uh, evenings uh, over the course of the fall. Uh, tomorrow evening, uh, we have, uh, b because of the moon cooperating, and if the uh, clouds cooperate, we'll focus on sort of like deep space viewing. Uh, on September 14th and 15th, we'll look at the crescent moon. Uh, I, I really love being able to just sort of take advantage of the low light field and sort of like do some unaided astronomy. So we'll be pointing out like the earth shine and things like that and also take a look at the Terminator and also the planets later on in the evening. And then October 6th uh, is, um, uh, we're hoping to have a star party because that would coincide with uh, the municipality of Pontiac's annual um, uh, fall fair. And so uh, for any of these events, if you're interested in coming out to see what's going on, you're more than welcome. And if you're interested in bringing a telescope too, that would be great. Uh, and um, we're really boosting the October 6th star party. Uh, 
Uh, and so it would be wonderful if uh, a few people would, would come out and join us. We'll have good representation from the Regroupement des Astronomes Amateurs de Louda Québécois there as well. Thank you. Yeah, sure. We're, we're uh, in Luskville, Quebec, so if you get to the Champlain Bridge, it's probably about 25, 30 minutes from when you first get into uh, Quebec. And so the idea was to have a not perfectly dark sky site, but something that you could get out and it would make a difference to the skies. And then also you could sort of do it for an evening back and forth. So, so that's where we are. And if you go to... Um, astroponiac.ca, we have uh, directions and links on the Google Maps to, to find us. Sure. All right, thank you, Stefan. It's, uh, it's quite exciting to see uh, the progress you guys have made at, at that site and with that project. Uh, I remember when I first started coming to the RASP back in 2011, uh, just seeing the program just in its infancy and, and it, it's nice to see it uh, have come to fruition. So thank you for all the updates you've brought us over the years. All right, so we're going to shuffle the agenda a little bit here. We're going to have uh, Simon up next. I was uh, too excited for Simon's talk to wait till the second half, so we're pulling him up. Good job I didn't turn up any later than I did. All right. Let's just see where we are here. There we go. What have we got? There. Yeah. Very good. Okay. So that's good. Okay. I can do this. <coughs> All righty. In my second talk in this uh, series on rapidly evolving solar system science, it was entitled Chondrules. And it focused on understanding of what happened in the early solar system between zero and about five million years after the formation of the very first objects. And those very first objects, of course, are calcium aluminium inclusions, what we find in chondritic meteorites. And we saw how the new thinking, if I can call it that, indicates that chondrules and chondrites are, in fact, a byproduct of the accretionary process and not a precursor as was classically thought until very recently. And then I do that. Maybe I do that. I'm pressing the big arrow. Oh, oh I went too far. I'm getting too excited now. Yep. I'm assuming the projector's up there. OK, good, right. Now, in my first two talks in this series regarding the behavior of the protoplanetary accretionary disk and the formation of those chondrules, I presented this list of five fundamental headaches. They called them, whoops, I'll get this right. There we go. They called them bottlenecks, but they were being more polite. And these are headaches confronting professional planetary scientists trying to understand the solar system formation today. By the way, if you miss these talks, you can find them on my website uh, on the Planetary Geology Stroke Presentations page, or if you go through the uh, RESC Audible website, you can get there via the Education tab. Now, tonight we're going to shift our attention to the behavior of the planets during the first half billion years of solar system history and examine headache number three. There we go. Did the giant planets migrate, and if so, how and when? In other words, we're going to look at how the Nice Grand Tac model of the migration of Jupiter and Saturn impacted the ongoing evolution of the rest of the solar system, paying particular attention to when it might have happened. <clears throat> now, this is very important because it has implications for the cataclysmic late heavy bombardment that is supposed, and I emphasize supposed, is supposed to have occurred at about 3.8, 3.9 billion years ago, if it happened at all. And this is important because our understanding of when things happened on the different bodies that make up our solar system is currently all hinged on the late heavy bombardment and the assumption that it really occurred. 
Now, before I go any further, I should define a few key concepts. Gravitational scattering of debris is a multifaceted process whereby gravitational interactions with planets, not physical collisions, Gravitational interactions scatter accretionary di disk debris, either inwards or outwards. And that leads variously to a number of things, to the exchange of angular momentum between the accretionary debris and the planets doing the scattering, the migration of the scattering planets as the angular momentum is exchanged, and decrease of orbital eccentricity and orbital inclination of those same planets. So what do we mean here? This is just a reminder that Orbital eccentricity simply means the deviation from a circular orbit. So this would be an extreme eccentricity, and this is an eccentricity of zero. And inclination simply means the inclination of the plane of the orbit with respect to the ecliptic, in which most of the major planets more or less lie. The classic example of this you all know about is Pluto, the dwarf planet, which is in a highly inclined orbit to the, the, um, uh, the rest of the solar system. Now, most importantly, decrease of orbital eccentricity and orbital uh, inclination itself can lead to planetary, mi planetary migration to new resonant orbital configurations. And that's where pairs of planets uh, change the ratio of their orbits around the sun. So, for example, a, a planet not closer to the sun might go around three times compared with a planet further out from the sun, which maybe only goes around twice. And that resonance ratio could change to something else, like two to one, as these planets are migrating around. Now, why has this nice grand tack model taken center stage in recent thinking about the solar system evolution? Quite simply, because it's very seductive. It seems to explain a lot of otherwise difficult to explain observations. For example, it predicts that Mars should be smaller than the other rocky planets, Earth and Venus, which has been a head-scratcher for quite a while. It predicts the zone structure of the asteroid belt. We'll deal with that in a moment. It can even provide an explanation of how water ended up so abundant on Earth, which again has been a head-scratcher for quite a while. It can even account for the observed orbital eccentricities and inclinations of the planets and their velocities. Now, the grand tack component of the model, which you see here outlined in red, predicts that the evolving orbital resonances of Jupiter and Saturn push the two gas giants to migrate outward away from the sun after an initial inward migration. That's where the word grand tack comes from. It's like a, 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 sail, a sailing boat sailing against the wind. It tacks back and forth. Now, the Nice component, which you see here outlined in blue, this predicts that Uranus and Neptune also migrated outward into the Kuiper belt of comets and planetesimals that were gravitationally flung back towards the sun, colliding with the planets and their moons during what became known as the late heavy bombardment. In other words, the Nice Grand Tank model is pretty much required if we are to explain the late heavy bombardment. Now, the meaning of heavy bombardment is immediately apparent to any amateur astronomer who looks at the surface of the moon or to anyone looking at internet images of the surfaces of Mercury or Mars or some of the ice moons such as uh, Callisto and, and Ganymede around Jupiter. But why late? Late because the standard model requires that the heavy bombardment occurred at about 3.8, 3.9 billion years ago based on the radiometric dating absolute dating, of lunar samples returned by the Apollo astronauts. Now, the nice grand tack model can be fine-tuned so that the uh, interference with the Kuiper belt is delayed so as to provide a heavy bombardment mechanism at 3.8, 3.9 billion years ago, but therein lies the headache. The model starts at 4.6 billion years ago. So why the delay of more than 600 million years before the Nice component of the model kicks off the late heavy bombardment? It began to look like special pleading, and that makes scientists very uncomfortable. So the most recent questions being asked by planetary scientists looking at the solar system can be summarized as, 
How do we know there was ever a cataclysmic bombardment, and why did it have to happen at 3.8, 3.9 billion years ago? And that's what's indicated here. Here's the number, the number of, of comets hitting the, the, the moon as a, as a model. This is time. This is four and a half billion years ago. Here's present. And the idea is, is there's the, 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 there is the, the, the late heavier bombardment on this slide called a lunar cataclysm. But the other question they're asking is, what if the heavy, late heavy bombardment, or the heavy bombardment, I should call it, occurred closer to the beginning of the solar system and simply tailed off after four and a half billion years ago? In other words, this line here, what if it was a smooth decline? So those are the questions that the professionals are actually currently asking themselves. <clears throat> so let's turn to what exactly the nice grand Tack model predicts and how it does it. And then let's look at the issue of timing and its consequences for our understanding of the solar system as a whole. But before we go there, a word of warning. Astrophysicists have been working on mathematical simulation models of the early history of the solar system for a long time now. And even without getting into the evolution of the models, the justification of the model parameters has become somewhat complex. So it'll come as no surprise to you you know me well enough. I'm going to gloss over some of the details and focus on getting the big picture across here. Now, this summary diagram for the Nice Grand Tank model, it actually comes from a series of papers written by the professionals on this very subject. It looks pretty busy, but in fact, it's pretty easy to follow. It's made of six horizontal blocks. They're, 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 there's the first one. They're numbered. You can see the blocks here. <coughs> Six horizontal blocks, and they correspond to time slices. And in fact, if your eyes are good, you can see 0,000 years, 70,000 years, 100, 300, 500,000 years, and then down here, it jumps to a much larger number, which we'll discuss in a, mo in a moment. So those first five blocks represent time from zero to about 500,000 years. You don't very often hear me talking here about thousands of years. Here's my spoiler alert. Did you just notice my deliberate attempt to confuse? How can a model that spans a half a million years be used to explain a sequence of events that took 600 million years? More on this later. Now, the left side of each block is closest to the sun over here. And as you move to the right, you move out. Whoops, there I go again. And as you move to the right, you're moving out in, uh, in astronomical units. One astronomical unit is the distance of the Earth from the Sun. So one astronomical unit would be about there. <laughs> the black circles are the four giant planets with Jupiter sitting to the left of the others. So it's the biggest one in all of these time slices. And if you take a careful look, you'll see that the black circles, other than Jupiter, change size due to the accretion of gas and ice as we move through time. And moving through time is going down. So let's take Saturn. You can see Saturn getting bigger and bigger and bigger, and then it sort of stabilizes in its size. And the others do the same thing. Now, the model starts in box one at time zero. So let's take a look at the starting configuration. So box one is this one up here. <coughs> Inboard, to the left of Jupiter, we can see a red stripe. That's this thing here. And, and, and this represents planetesimals. By planetesimals, think of asteroids of all kinds of sizes. And they uh, would be classified as ordinary chondrite material. And it's called technically S-type. Why they use S, I'm not too sure, but they do. Now, outboard to the right of Jupiter are a series of blue stripes. And they represent planetesimals that we will classify as supposedly primitive carbonaceous chondrite. They're referred to as C-type. It makes sense to me. Now, notice the purple material out here. It is, in fact, purple. A little difficult to see that, but it is purple. And this represents the Kuiper belt materials in the model, probably icy comets and, and Pluto-like dwarf planets. Yes, Paul? I'm sorry to interrupt, but what defines time zero in this model? Oh, uh, um, that's, that, that's simply the starting, the, 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 the starting point. I'm going to address that in just 30 seconds. Okay, thank you, 
Yep. And finally, notice here, these open circles. My fingers are just too big. There we go. There we go. Those open circles up there, they represent, they're between Jupiter and the Sun, and these represent lots of planetoids that sit where the rocky planets we see today will eventually form. Now, all these materials start on the same line marked zero on the vertical scale. And since the vertical scale represents orbital eccentricity, zero indicates a circular orbit for every element in the model. Why this starting configuration? Quite simply because they have to start somewhere. Obviously, we have no idea of what the initial orbits of the real planetesimals look like. So this is one of the huge oversimplifications of the model, just to start with. Okay, so far so good, but what's missing from this diagram? Orbital inclination. It is included in the calculated model, but it's too complicated to include in this particular summary diagram. So let's start the model and move to box or time slice number two. That's this one here at 70,000 years. What do we see? We already see major changes. First, we see that Jupiter has migrated inwards towards the Sun. And it's left the other giant planets behind. Second, we see that Saturn is beginning to grow. Compare that with that. And it's growing, growing at this time, but it's, significantly, it's growing significantly more slowly than Jupiter did before, so, before it. Third, we can see a great scattering of the orbital eccentricities of the S and C-type planetesimals. Remember, th this scattering up in this direction here, that isn't above the, 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 the uh, uh, ecliptic. That is simply a measure of the shape of the orbits. The orbits are becoming, going from circular to becoming highly e elliptical. And that means, yeah, exactly. So that means that the orbits are, are, are disturbed into all kinds of elliptical shapes. And fourth, notice how the S-type planetesimals, the red ones here, are being perturbed between Jupiter and the Sun. And some have been gravitationally flung into new, or new orbits outboard of Jupiter. In other words, they've been flung to the right. You see them mixing in here with these, th these, the, these blue planetesimals. Finally, notice how the Kuiper belt here remains totally unaffected and undisturbed by all these goings on. If we now move on to the 100,000 year time slice, that's number three here, we see that Saturn has grown rapidly to full size. It's migrated inwards towards the Sun and it's caught up with Jupiter. We also see that the mixing of the S and C, the red and the blue planetesimals, is progressing apace. That's really getting quite mixed in here, although it's clear there's more reds to the left and more blues to the right. I should have pointed that way, shouldn't I? Okay. So um, let's zoom in on the innermost part of the model and watch what happens. This is an animation. Watch what happens during the first 100,000 years to the S-type planetesimals that were originally all confined sunward of Jupiter, Jupiter and Saturn. <coughs> and, and, and we're looking at a distance here from the, the Sun through to about five astronomical units here. So here we see Jupiter and Saturn. The Sun is not shown to the left. And we also see that the vertical scale, there are two diagrams, so one of them will give us the orbital eccentricity and one will give us the orbital inclination. Don't worry about this dashed box here for the moment. It represents the present-day position of the main asteroid belt. We'll look at that later. So, Chris, can, do, do, do you click on this for me to get this thing to run? There we go. And can we just run it a number of times while I'm talking until I say stop? So with this animation, we can see Jupiter and Saturn migrate towards the Sun, which is to the left. Saturn catches up with Jupiter, and the orbits of the planetesimals are thoroughly disturbed in 3D, both their orbital shapes and their orbital inclinations. And that many of the planetesimals are gravitationally flung towards the outer solar system. What is driving the inward migration of Jupiter and Saturn? To put it simply, the giant planets exchange angular momentum with the gas of the early solar nebula, and that is what causes them to migrate inwards towards the sun. Okay, did we run that a couple of times and everyone got to see that? Good. So let's move on. I go, actually, we'll let it run one more time. 
Okay. Uh -huh. oh, there we go. Very good. So that, that animation covered the goings-on in the inner solar system during time slices one through three. By the time we get to time slice number four, here at 300,000 years, <coughs> things have changed dramatically. The mixing of the planetesimals is now more thorough, although there are still more reds to the sunward side and more blues to the outward side. But the big change is the migration direction of the Jupiter-Saturn pair, plus the outward migration of the now fully grown Uranus and Neptune that stirs up the Kuiper belt material. So here's Jupiter and Saturn, and they've migrated out from this position. So, uh, Uranus and, and Neptune have migrated outwards as well, and have now disturbed the Kuiper belt material, which is beginning to change both its position uh, and, uh, and its, its eccentricity, in other words, the shapes of the orbits. Good. Now, what's illustrated in this time slice can either be seen as the end of the Grand Tack or the initial conditions for the Nice component of the model. It really isn't absolutely clear where you want to put the boundary between the one component and the other. So, Let's now, oh dear, that was not what was supposed to happen. I'm going to give the whole game away here. Chris, can, can you take me back? I've got to go back, not a little further. There we are. Come on, you can do this. Come on. I think the battery in this is dying. Okay, what did we get to there? Okay, good. So let's zoom in now on the inner part of this time slice and watch what happens between 100 and 600,000 years to the S and C type, the red and blue planetesimals, during that transition from the Grand Tack component to the Nice model. And again, we'll see Jupiter and Saturn with the sun not shown to the left. And the vertical scale gives us both orbital eccentricity and, uh, and, 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 and orbital inclination. However, this time we do want to pay attention to this box here, which represents the modern position of the main asteroid belt. It's going to tell us something rather useful. So can we start that one up, please, Chris? Good. Now, the, the mixing of the S and C type planetesimals is now pretty clear. You see that in that latter phase here, as the uh, migrating planets migrating out from the sun actually start to disturb the blue planetesimals. However, c can you see when it stops? Can you see, here's the asteroid belt, and can you see the zonation in the asteroid belt with the S-type reds and the, the uh, uh, C-type blues, uh, uh, the zonation in the, um, uh, uh, within the asteroid belt? This is the last frame. I wanted it to th th things to be pretty clear here. And it's a blow-up of the last frame of that in animation. And it really emphasizes here, don't do this to me. Don't do this to me. You're a great audience and especially patient. There we go. If I can hit the right button this time. You can clearly see that in both of these diagrams, you've got a very clear zonation of the asteroid belt with these wet uh, carbonaceous uh, uh, chondrite uh, planetesimals to the outer part and these drier uh, S-type uh, 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 ordinary chondrite planetesimals to the inner part. Okay. Why do astrophysicists insist on separating the Grand Hack from the Nice model? Because the driving mechanisms are quite different. The inward migration of the Grand Tack is driven by interaction between the giant planets and the gas of the solar nebula. But the outward migration is driven by orbital resonances between the giant planets and between them and the remaining planetesimals left in the solar system after the gas has gone, after it's dissipated or has been consumed. So this is why they, 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 they make this distinction. Okay. Now, in time slice five, that's the one at the bottom, the giant planet, oh, that's at 500,000 years. That's not the one at the bottom, I'm wrong. That's this one here. 
The giant planets have now reached their modern distances from the sun, and the planetesimals have reached their ultimate degree of mixing, and the Nice model is approaching a climax. But look carefully at the planetesimals. Notice how some of the Kuiper belt material has now been gravitationally flung into the inner parts of the solar system. Some of this purple stuff has actually come out from here and is now actually turning up in here, even into the inner part of the solar system. And the tendency for the S-type asteroid, uh, asteroids to predominate in the inner asteroid belt and the C-type material to predominate in the outer asteroid belt is visible even in this summary diagram. You can see it here quite clearly. And even here you can start to you can see it. The blues are over here and the reds are over there. What about time slice 6 to jump forward to 150 million years? What's it doing here in this diagram? Basically, it just illustrates that after all the dust has settled, pun intended, we see the modern configuration of the solar system with four rocky planets, a zoned asteroid belt, plus Jupiter and Saturn where they are today. And there are our four rocky planets. There's our asteroid belt, Jupiter and Saturn. Now, I mentioned water earlier. The heat of accretion, coupled with the heat from radioactive decay, especially from very short-lived uh, isotopes like aluminium-26, led the rocky planets to melt and differentiate, which would have driven off any primordial water. So the question of where water came from on the rocky planets was a point of much debate prior to the nice grand Tack model. Can we run this one, please, Chris? Oh, before you do, before you do, before you do. Notice here, these green dots here, they're green with nothing in them. And they represent rocky planets as they are evolving. And of course, the red and the blue are our, our, our familiar S and C type planetesimals. So let's run the animation now. Can you run it by going forward? I'm down here. Oh, there we go. <laughs> surprise. Oh, surprise. I have to run back what, what do I have to do to get it to go forward? Advance. Huh? Advance. Oh, advance. Now he tells me. There we go. All right. Now, what this image illustrates is how the, the Nice component of the model proposes that during the mixing of S and C-type planetesimals, the carbonaceous chondrites in blue from the outer solar system brought water to the inner solar system where it accreted to the rocky planets, which are marked, as I say, in green. And the animation represents 150 million years, while the two panels on the right are the two still panels represent uh, 3 million years there and 44 million years here. Notice how the blue dots appear and grow within the green circles representing the successful accretion of carbonaceous chondrites and their water content. Here are the little blue dots in the, in the green ones. And then as the, the, the green planets so eliminate themselves, we find that these two planets here have got abundant water. So I'm on my own without Chris now. No training wheels. So how do we pack 600 million years of solar system evolution into a half a million year model? No one's sure. And that's a very major headache that I'll address in just a second. So having looked at the how of the Nice model, oh, you reckon this might, might work better? Yes. Thank you. So having looked at the how of the Nice Grand Tack model, Maybe we should now look at what planetary scientists are saying about the when. Let's see if I can do this. Yes. So in December of 2016, I gave a presentation at this very podium regarding the recent questioning by planetary scientists of the impact history of our own moon. Up until the last decade, the standard model defined the late heavy bombardment as a cataclysmic event that was dated at 3.8, 3.9, using rock samples returned from the moon by the Apollo program. Samples interpreted to represent the event, the, the, the events that created the major Mare basins, major Mare impact basins, consistently yielded what were taken to be formation ages in the range of 3.8, 3.9. Hence, the late heavy bombardment was accepted as a solar system-wide cataclysm. Notice the Imbrium impact basin here dated at 3.85 billion years ago. It's the youngest of the basalt-filled Mare basins on the moon's near side. Keep it in mind. NASA's Apollo rock samples, principally impact breaches, 
that's rocks which were crushed by the force of impact, and impact melts, which are rocks that were melted by the heat of impact, all came from a relatively limited area on the moon's surface. They all came from this area here, for security reasons, by the way. In the 1970s, scientists used two methods to obtain the ages of impact basin formation. The first looked at the uranium lead de radioactive decay, uranium breaking down to lead, in grains of a mineral called zircon. And there's a, mineral, a, a zircon grain right here in a rock sample. The problem was that they used an old method of dissolving all of the grain in acid prior to analyzing the uranium and lead content. We now know that zircons can have really complex microstructure with internal domains and external rims, each of which can represent distinct new growths and or a resetting of the uranium lead clock. In short, represent different events. So by analyzing the whole grain in this manner, you end up with mixed or meaningless ages. One way of getting around this problem was to analyze the isotopes of argon in the impact melts. And when they did this, they obtained a spike here. This time, this time the time goes from old to younger. And there is about 3.8, 3.9. They got this spike in, the, in ages, the number of ages, at about 3.8, 3.9 billion years, implying that something major happened on the moon at this time. However, when they looked at the argon isotopes of meteorites from across the solar system, including lunar meteorites that had come from, from the moon, here, well, don't do that again. Lunar meteorites from the moon, uh, chondritic meteorites from, from across the solar system, and then these, uh, this family of meteorites also from across the solar system, the 3.8, 3.9 signature vanishes. It's not there, except for the Apollo samples. And that, of course, is what this is. There's the Apollo samples there. Scientists quickly realized what had likely happened. It looked like the radioactive clocks in all of the Apollo samples had been reset by the youngest Murray impact basin event on the side facing us at 3.8, 3.5 billion years ago, the event that formed Imbrium. So where does all of this leave us? What are our take-home messages regarding the first half billion years of solar system history? My first take-home message is that the nice grand tack model may be better calibrated in time to what really happened than first appears. We now realize that a cataclysmic bombardment event at 3.8, 3.9 billion years ago is highly improbable. If there ever was such an event, it occurred much earlier than that. In fact, it may have occurred so early that it's indistinguish indistinguishable from the beginning of accretion itself, which would be the case if the nice grand tank model really does represent the first 500,000 years of solar system history, provided you take out the rocky planets from the model, because they have to have formed later. But then there would be no reason to, inv to invoke a late heavy bombardment at all of any age. Rather, Initial rapid accretion would have gradually slowed as a tailing off, referred to technically as an accretionary tail. Oh, and that is exactly what that is, compared with beginning of the solar system, and then this weird 600 million year pause, and then suddenly the late heavy bombardment, perhaps mythological late heavy bombardment. However, as always, there are other ways of looking at things, Perhaps there was a late heavy bombardment as predicted by the Nice Grand Tack model. It just occurred earlier than we think, at some unspecified time between uh, before four, 4 billion years. Alternatively, there was indeed an overall accretionary tail onto which the Nice Grand Tack processes grafted more of a, an uptick in impact events as opposed to a late heavy bombardment. Right now, everything's on the table. My second take-home message is that whether or not a late heavy bombardment occurred, the Nice Grand Tank model is still considered by most planetary scientists, but not all. 
to provide the best explanation to date for so many other aspects of the overall nature of the solar system. And finally, the third take-home message is that until quite recently, planetary scientists thought we had a yardstick by which to correlate events on, on the surfaces of most solid objects across the solar system. But without a late heavy bombardment, that yardstick disappears. Even with a late heavy bombardment, they now realize that if it really happened at all, they don't know, really know when. And they don't know how strong it might have been. So they don't know how much they can attribute to it. In short, everything currently seems to be up for grabs. So what's the short-term solution? I've said this to you before from this podium. Return to the moon and sample more globally, not just where the Apollo uh, program landed. Perform radiometric dating to exacting modern standards. Don't just dissolve all the zircons up and put them into a batch of acid. And evaluate the existence of a cataclysmic event once and for all. Stay tuned. Solar system science is about to get even more interesting and even more fascinating. And as amateur astronomers, we have front row seats. As always, thanks for listening. The fourth question is, is there any evidence that a passing star could in fact have been responsible for stirring up the Kuiper Belt? It's been talked about for, 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 for a long time. And uh, fundamentally, the answer is no. What kind of evidence might there be? Uh, it, would, it would have to have exchanged material with our solar system and would have to have left something which was a signature of that passing star. Uh, possibly parts of its own solar system, had they been of a different composition from our own. Uh, to the best of my knowledge, though, there's nothing tangible that one can put one's hand on. People have done calculations. There are numerical models trying to explain exactly that. Then the question is, of course, of timing. We don't know when to time this now. At least uh, uh, 10 years ago, we could say, well, something had to happen at about 3.9 billion years now we don't even know if there was a late heavy bombardment when it would have occurred. I was just wondering, with, with respect to the mention that you made of, of water uh, uh, on, on the terrestrial planets and that, I mean, you, you had that isotopic analysis from the, the European mission uh, to, the, to the comet, and that seemed to uh, maybe not discard the theory, but certainly put a doubt in theory that, that comets from the, from the, uh, from the work site. Paul's asking about the, uh, the isotopic, uh, isotopic analyses of uh, cometary material and wondering whether that actually contains any clues to, to answer the question about a passing star. That was actually analyzed to answer a different question. The original idea was, well, comets are full of ice, so the comets actually brought water to, to, to the Earth. Then they began looking at the comet's uh, 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 isotopic uh, composition, isotopic composition of the water, how much deuterium versus how much hydrogen they contained. And they said, oh, that doesn't work because it's not the same composition as Earth's water. So then they looked at carbonaceous chondrites and said, oh, look, the isotopic uh, co composition of water in those asteroids, that matches the Earth. <laughs> then, of course, somebody looked at another recent comet and found that, well, there are comets that actually contain the same deuterium hydrogen composition as the Earth. So we've gone round and round and round in circles, but it doesn't actually address the question of whether or not uh, a passing star through ice at us. If it had been, uh, uh, if we were picking up ice which was totally different in composition from anything else, we could suggest that perhaps there was traces of something coming in from outside. But it wouldn't have to be due to a passing star. It could be. The question there is, if we're looking at extrasolar planetary systems, which we are, the question is, how come that we don't see water 
in those extrasolar systems when we do in our solar system? Well, the answer is, and again, it was, I think it's in the last few months, they have actually identified water. They've been using the same process, essentially, as trying to identify water on Jupiter, which was another recent announcement. Um, so we do know that, in fact, the, the uh, solar systems beyond our own contain water. But that really isn't a surprise because the molecular clouds which would have collapsed to form these solar systems, including our own, we've known for a long time now that those molecular clouds contain water. Water is actually very common throughout the solar system. Now, I've got to be a little more precise about this. It's not drops of water out there. It's not somebody can go out there and have a shower in a molecular cloud. It's actually oxygen and hydrogen, just one hydrogen, what you'd call a, 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 a a hydroxyl ion, but all it needs is another oxygen and there's water. The, the, the Oort cloud is certainly not included in this model other than, uh, no, in fact it's not, it's, it's outside of the, the, uh, the, the Kuiper belt. Um, I don't know that anyone's really defined a, a workable model for the formation of the Oort cloud. It's just considered to be basically the leftovers. That's all I can really tell you. Okay. Thank you very much, Simon. So I really enjoyed that series of presentations, Simon, and I hope, uh, I hope you've got another one, in the, uh, another one baking there for us uh, in the near future. All right, Chuck. Okay, this is a segue right in from Simon's uh, talk. Here's an asteroid and there's a whole bunch of chondrules. That'd be kind of cool. And uh, I'm a kind of a science fiction fan and Arthur C. Clarke brought the subject up once about meteorites. He said, the coolest thing, if we could find a fossilized electronic component inside a meteorite, wouldn't that be cool? <laughs> Anyway, this is kind of an extension of last month's uh, trivia, and we did have one winner last uh, month, and uh, again, I have a shatter cone here. I'll leave it out here for you to look at it during the break, and if somebody can answer this, uh, we got a shatter cone from the Charlevoix crater. Now, um, questions about orbital mechanics and so on, they seem simple, but they're really not. As we found from last uh, month, this was the uh, question from last month, uh, uh, Derek uh, jumping, jumping 2.4 meters, if you did this on the Earth, how far could you go on the Moon? And the simple question is just divide it by the, the, the magnitude of the gravity on the Moon and hence we get it, but it's not quite that easy. What we have to do, we have to consider the center of mass. In other words, Derek actually just moved his center of mass over the bar. And he had a head start of almost a meter. So if you look at it, from a meter and his center of mass actually jumped, or he caused his center of mass to jump 1.4 meters. Whoops, what did I do? And one, that gives him his 2.4 meters. So to find out how far he could jump on the moon, we take off the center of mass uh, uh, height, just the 1.4, add multiple, or divide that by the moon's gravity, and what you have, he moved his he will move his center of mass on the moon 8.43 meters, and if you add the center of mass to it, whoops, his yeah here we go, his total would be 9.434, and as I say, we had one winner last month there, so. As a segue to here, take Derek, uh, we took him to the moon to jump. What happens if we take him to Phobos? Now, it gets a little bit complicated. There's all kinds of orbital mechanics, and I'll, uh, I'll tell you a couple of stories here. Arthur C. Clarke, again, my science fiction hero, um, he mentioned that if you had enough uh, thrust from a, for an astronaut, say a trebuchet or something like that, and throw him into space, well, you have to consider the orbital mechanics of Mars and Phobos and so on. What would happen is that the astronaut would drift, have his own orbit around the 
th uh, Mars, but every half orbit of Phobos, the astronaut would come back to Phobos. Essentially, his orbit would intersect Phobos every half uh, rotation. And um, again, if uh, you like uh, short stories, uh, Arthur C. Clarke had a good uh, short story called um, Hide and Seek. And essentially it was about a spaceship, a bunch of bad guys in a spaceship chasing an astronaut on Phobos. And it was kind of cool uh, using science fiction to describe orbit, orbital mechanics, and it was kind of cool. But Phobos 20 kilometers across, uh, a circumference of less than 70 kilometers, say. And here's the astronaut, he could, uh, one jump, he could uh, do a kilometer. So essentially 70 steps, he'd be around Phobos. So essentially, he could keep the bad guy's spaceship in sight by hiding behind rocks just by running around Phobos. It was kind of cool. So, on to the question. Let's make it simple. Let's do a standing jump, not a high jump. Now, you take a typical astronaut, and he could move a center of mass, and he would require 376.3 joules to move 0.48 meters. Now, I've got this all off the internet and uh, sky and telescope, so it has to be right, right? <laughs> so, the trivia question to win this shatter cone, what would be the largest solid asteroid this astronaut not could reach an escape velocity just with his muscle power? Hmm. There is an answer, and it was in Sky and Telescope, if you have a quick Google. So, here's the rules. No guessing. Show me your calculations if you get it. Um, in event of a tie, uh, what is the largest rubble pile sized astro uh, asteroid you could uh, reach your escape velocity from? So, get your calculators out or your uh, internet working and see if you can figure it out. So, shatter cone if you get it. And break time. <laughs> yeah, okay. Basically, name the asteroid this astronaut not could jump off. The biggest asteroid, uh, a smaller asteroid, easy. One that's a little bit bigger, he'd return to the asteroid. There is an answer. <laughs> All right, thank you, Chuck. We're going to go to break. Uh, it's 8.26. I'll put the question back up during the break. Uh, it's 8.26 now. Let's, uh, let's take 10 minutes and reconvene at 8.35. All right, Chuck. Okay, I had, uh, first of all, I had a lot of questions about what exactly is a shatter cone. And um, it is very fortunate that we can actually have shatter cones to identify impact craters. A shatter cone uh, has a special signature on it. And after the meeting, if you want to talk, uh, ask me more about it, I'll be here. But it's one signature you can actually see with your eyeball. Um, on my website, uh, everybody thinks, oh, you just find a circular lake and it has to be a crater. Well, I've demonstrated a couple of uh, examples of one lake that is not an impact and one lake that looks exactly like the other one, and it is an impact site. So it is a case of a little bit of a geology uh, study. So, unfortunately, nobody uh, won the shatter cone this time. Uh, Jerry won it last, last month, and uh, where are we here? There we go. Okay, so um, unbeknownst to uh, me, the answer was actually put up there. Um, if you knew what a, uh, an asteroid of around 3.9 kilometers, you would have got, if you knew an asteroid of that, because if somebody was, was quick enough to Google that, they would have got this formula. And what it is, um, there's, there, there's, uh, probably a day-long lecture to find this, to end up with this formula. But essentially, what we have is uh, the magic number of 3.9. This is a square root set symbol here. The density of the Earth and the density of the object that we want to jump from. So, uh, the 
the size of the object would be higher and uh, inverse proportional to the uh, density of the object we're jumping from. So I uh, made it easy. We made it uh, as a uh, uh, density of the planet Earth. So uh, the answer is around 3.9 kilometers is the diameter of a asteroid we can actually jump from with our own muscle power. And these are the answers. Again, these are from Sky and Telescope, so they don't lie, I don't think. <laughs> I never heard of these asteroids until I researched this, uh, this subject. And uh, uh, further on, for the rubble pile, it's actually uh, about nine kilometers uh, uh, that uh, the size of the asteroid to jump from. This is Aitokawa. Uh, Itokawa. I can't pronounce that. That's the one the Japanese uh, satellite um, uh, explored, oh, 10 years ago now, I guess. But that is a rubble, pl rubble pile. And I really don't know if there is a rubble, rubble pile bigger than nine uh, uh, kilometers because it would probably rotate itself apart. Anyway, um, next uh, question. I'll try and figure out something a little bit easier so somebody could win this, but unfortunately nobody won it. <laughs> Oh yeah, that's right. Uh, yeah, Vex. Um, another story here. Uh, this is the first slide I put up, and we could not, with our own muscle power, jump escape velocity off of Ida, but uh, dactyl way, way off in the distance, we could actually jump off this asteroid to make it to here. Now it's 90 kilometers, so don't miss. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for reminding me. Thanks. Thanks, Chuck. All right, up next, we've got our observation reports. Uh, we've got quite a few this month, so if you're on this list, please make your way and, uh, and queue up there. Uh, so, Jim, you're up first. And if we could dim these lights, it would be great. Should I talk uh, fast or slow? Oh, uh, you're good. Okay. Forward, back, laser. Forward, back, laser. Don't touch the bottom button. Don't touch the bottom button. All right. Okay, the uh, first three images are um, an example of the kind of thing that you can achieve nowadays using what uh, is called video astronomy, or some people say, call it uh, electronically assisted astronomy. So um, the first three images were all captured by me while I was on vacation up at my cottage. Uh, with a very simple um, four-inch refractor on a little Altaz um, Ioptron Cube Pro. And I used a ZWO camera, but there's many other cameras that you can use to do the same thing. And what has brought us to this point um, to give us images like this sort of in semi-real time is the software. Software has come a long way and is allowing you to um, acquire frames and stack them in real time and do some uh, photo uh, editing um, in real time. So this is, um, it's about four minutes of, of uh, data collection. They were five second long subframes, all stacked. And uh, I had a light pollution filter on, that's why the uh, the definition in the nebula is, is quite quite sharp. So this is uh, M20, the Triffid Nebula, and its neighbor, um, M21, an open cluster. The next object is slightly uh, north along the Milky Way from M20. This is M24, the Sagittarius star cloud. Uh, again, this is about four minutes of stacking five second long subs. And you can see you can pull out some really nice detail. And it, you can even see kind of the brown and darker uh, veil over covering our view of uh, looking into the center of our galaxy. So <coughs> this is not a cluster of stars that we see. This is looking through a hole of of uh, dust and gas into the center of our galaxy to see all of those stars that we can't normally see. So I thought that was a neat shot, especially the uh, really well-defined 
uh, dark nebulae over on the bottom right. And then the third one from, from that particular evening is uh, the Western Veil, which is uh, still uh, quite uh, observable right now. It's starting to make its way into the west, but it's still uh, mostly overhead at sunset. And it's uh, the brighter of the three parts of uh, the whole veil complex, which is the remains of a, a supernova explosion. I especially like the, uh, the colors in this. I thought that really turned out quite what nice. <laughs> that is an excellent question. What is a true color, really? Um, Well, color is entirely uh, a human perception thing. We, that's just the way our brain interprets different wavelengths of light. So all that I know from this image is that where there is red color, there is hydrogen that's emitting light. Where there is green, there is oxygen emitting light. What it actually would look like if I was there right next to it, well, that's... That's up for debate, because the way our eyes see light is different than the way the camera sees light. And I had a filter on, so the filter is also altering what the camera is seeing. So this looks nice to me. And so I say that it looks natural. I don't know. Um, but yeah, it, it's an interesting topic. And if you go on to user groups for astrophotographers using different palettes, replacing the reds with greens, and there's all kinds of interesting things you can do to make it look differently. But what it actually looks like scientifically, well, that's kind of up for debate. But anyway. So yeah, that, that was the last from, that was in uh, early July, before the, uh, the smoke rolled in <laughs> from, the, from the forest fires. What size refractor was that? Then? That was the four inch, the, the 98 millimeter, at uh, about F. 4.2, I think I was using. Um, so this was later in the summer, more recently, uh, trying to get some uh, a last look at Saturn and Mars before they are too far to the west for me to see from my backyard. So these, this is all from my backyard on the same evening. Um, I tried using two different filters. Uh, I tried first a uh, full color filter, um, as well as a uh, IR pass filter. So all the, the four images on the right are all only infrared light and then everything on the left is just uh, natural color. And I also tried in the native focal length of my uh, my Ritchie Kretchen scope f8 and then with an f or uh, 2.5 times Barlow on it. So I guess the only thing to note is um, the advantage of using the IR pass filter is um, longer wavelengths are less affected by atmospheric dispersion and the unsteady seeing, which is typically what you see all the time in the city, a really bad seeing. So it helped a lot with the clarity of the object. You can see the definition of uh, these details here compared to the color image is a lot better. So that's something that the use of the IR pass filter helps with. Uh, a little more recent, so this was uh, on the 30th of August. Uh, I was lucky to get a clear sky break and the, the um, thunderstorms we had had washed out a lot of the smoke from the sky, so the transparency was good. So this is the same camera as I used earlier in the summer, but this is from my backyard in the Alta Vista area. Uh, it's a uh, on the 10 inch Ritchie Crechain at about f4.5 I think. Uh, I used uh, light pollution filters as well. And uh, I, I took a number of other images that night, but I, I wanted to show this one just because I think it's one of the most interesting shots of M8, the Lagoon Nebula, I've ever got. It really shows the layers of, of gas. Like you have the, the cold, dark areas here in front, but then there's several layers of, of gas, kind of a whitish layer, and then there's a reddish layer behind that. I thought that it turned out kind of neat. And if you look at the, the perimeter here, this dark, these dark kind of fingers around the outside, it's sort of like the, uh, the, the edges of the gas shell being pried open by the, 
the UV light coming from the, the young cluster of stars in the middle. So I thought that was a pretty neat shot. This was about, I uh, can't remember. Well, this was more like 10 minutes of 10 second subs stacked. And the last uh, few shots were taken the same night. I switched cameras to a monochrome camera and took some, uh, some zoomed in shots of the moon. So this is Crater Posidonius, one of my favorites. It uh, has a, a really unusual structure on the floor. Um, most craters you think is a, are a bowl shape, but in this particular case, because of the, uh, all the uh, volcanic activity, like the lava that flooded the floor here, there was some heaving on the floor of this crater. It's no longer flat, it's actually kind of pushed up and cracked open. That's why you can see this ridge here is actually uh, the floor of the crater has been pushed up and it's all split apart. So it's kind of a neat crater to, uh, to look at. Uh, next was uh, Theophilus and um, Cyrillus. It's the older one down here. I always like to look at this crater because it gives you um, a really good idea of what happens during the impact. You can see very clearly there is an apron of material around the perimeter and even overlapping Cyrillus here and that's the, uh, the melt apron. So that was all you know, material that was liquefied during the impact and splashed out of away from the impact zone. And then beyond that, there's all these little secondary impacts. So solid debris that was thrown out, uh, hitting along the surface here in all directions. I thought that was pretty, pretty neat. And then the, uh, the third one is the, uh, one of the observing targets for the month of August, uh, Crater Clavius and its uh, craterlets, which are th this, this ring here of uh, craters in a line. It's kind of an uncanny alignment of, of craters of gradually reducing size. Um, yes? This is a, a 10 inch Ritchie Kretchen. It's a reflecting telescope. Uh, but I had a two times Barlow on, so I was at F. 16, so about uh, 4,000 millimeter focal length. Um, the camera I was using is also uh, very small pixels. I think they're about 2.9 micron pixel size, which gives also uh, a good resolution. And it's a monochrome camera with an IR pass filter. So we're, again, only looking at infrared light here to get as steady an image as I can. Um, the data is collected in the form of a video. So this was about 4,000 frames, I think, and I stacked just the top 5% to get this image. That's, uh, that is, you are looking at the edge of the disk of the moon there. Okay. It's not the terminator, uh, that's the edge of the moon. Uh, no. Well, not the far side. It's it's on the the edge of the of the sphere. So sometimes you can see more around the corner depending on the libration. But yeah, this is a, a mountain in profile. Um, so all the craterlets that were in the observing challenge, I could pick up pretty easily. I think the last, the smallest one was uh, J A. Clavius JA, which I believe was this guy right here. Uh, but there, you can see there's other craters in here that are even smaller. Smallest one, I think, is this guy right here, which is just under two kilometers across. Um, I worked out, just for kicks, what my resolution is here, and it's about a pixel for every 250 meters. So that's not too bad for Ottawa skies. Anyway, uh, that's it. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, and thank you for uh, covering one of the observing uh, challenges there. Uh, Bob, you're up next. There you are. 
click and which is which? Uh, that's advance back and then laser at the top. Okay, very good. Polymer 11 was one of the observant challenges. Uh, it's uh, discovered in the fifth, in 1950s by uh, Hubble and Arp and Abel and Zwicky, uh, was pretty famous astronomers, and they were looking at a survey of, from the of plates of, from the Mount Palomar, and they are uh, really uh, pretty faint and, uh, dare I say, uninteresting globular clusters. Uh, I'm not totally positive you could see this with a telescope, but maybe. Um, one of the things about it, one of the, for me, interesting things about it was is that whenever I'm looking at something, uh, get an image of something, that I don't know what it is, I Google it and see what somebody else said. And uh, this is a quote from a friend of mine. <laughs> it was the only quote I could find about uh, uh, Polymer 11. And it's uh, a guy called Jan Wisniewski, is a member of the Kingston Club, or it was. Um, yeah, it's, it's pretty pathetic. It's just, just so you know, is that, which one is the laser? Uh, the top. The top one right there? Yeah. yeah. It's that. Um, okay. Uh, this is uh, a little, another observing challenge. It's a, it's a little um, a, a planetary nebula. And uh, so it's basically an exploded star. It's pretty bright. It's, uh, it's 8.1 uh, magnitude. Uh, and it's about 3,500 uh, light, light years away from us. And it exploded, it's pretty new also. It exploded a few thousand years ago. So it's pretty small. Um, so, you know, really to see it a little better, I'll just, this is a, just an optical zoom. I'm cropping the image. And you get a little tighter. And you can see it definitely has shape. It's not, it's not a point. And uh, if you took a oxygen three filter and put it across and looked through it, I think the stars would vanish and the nebula would stay. Um, another observing challenge from a while ago was Albireo. And uh, Albireo is in the Cygnus the Swan. It's the head of the swan, or if you want, the tail of the Northern Cross. And it's um, a real interesting uh, sort of a, when you look at it in the telescope, gold and blue uh, double. And it, uh, it, uh, if you throw your telescope a little bit out of focus, you can see the colors better. And this, uh, this picture is one-tenth of a second. Uh, so it's pretty fast because this is pretty bright. Now, Mike uh, Mogadam posted a note on um, uh, the, the net uh, asking whether this was a real double or not. Or actually, he was telling us that, what, you know, uh, posting the question. And he said a guy called Phil uh, Plate had posted an answer to that. And using uh, Gaia data, which is a... Um, is a satellite put out by the uh, Europeans, and it does uh, positional, uh, has very good positional uh, pictures, and it also has a spectrometer, so it can do uh, rotational uh, uh, velocities. And uh, they were able to use that to find out how far away this was. And the way they do that is they look on either side of the Earth's orbit, say June and December, six months apart, and they look at the star and see what it, it, does it move against the background stars? And when they did that, they found out that the yellow one was 328 light years away, and the uh, blue one was 389 light years away. That's the set difference of 70 light years apart. They can't possibly be doubles. They can't possibly be a binary going around itself uh, if they're that far apart. But there's a problem with this, and that is that these are really bright stars. And I was thinking about, uh, I drive in uh, Saskatchewan every once in a while, and you pull out to pass somebody on those flat Saskatchewan highways, you can't tell if a car is a mile away or 100 meters away or 10 miles away. Um, it's sort of the old story, but you can watch your dog run away for three days. Uh, it's so flat. And you know, you can't tell how far away that car is because the, the lights are so bright. And so in this picture right here, notice there's no background stars to compare it to it's at one-tenth of a second exposure. So we'll look at it a bit, I hope. <laughs> what happened? Too far. Too far. Here, I'll, I'll point it back to you. Sure, OK. I'll 
Thank you. <laughs> Somebody put it back. All right, so here we go. So if you look at it, if you look at it uh, with a 60 second exposure, it's just blasted out. You know, you can't see any stars behind it because it's just a big blur. It's a, and it turns out that the error that you're seeing is approximately the same as the distance between them. <laughs> so that's not a really, you know, when you, you can't tell how far away that car is coming at you, you don't pull out and pass. And, uh, but they, what they did was this thing also has the ability to uh, do uh, how fast is it, how fast is it moving? And that error is uh, that error is 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 less susceptible to the uh, to to the brightness of the star. And they found out that these things are moving in different directions. And I know when you're going two things orbiting each other, they could be going in different directions. You know, like one coming towards you and one going away. But these are going way too fast. We call it proper motion in the sky. So these are definitely too far apart from each other and they're definitely going in the wrong directions to be in orbit with each other. It is what we call an accidental binary. They're just lined up in the sky and they look really nice when we look at them. You should look it up, by the way. You really should see it. This is the Lagoon Nebula, M8. Uh, again, it's in Sagittarius. Uh, this red that you're seeing is uh, hydrogen that's been blasted by those bright stars in the nebula and uh, it just glows red. And uh, it's too faint for us to see, by the way. <laughs> we can't see red this, this uh, faint. Um, but when you put it on a film, uh, gathering hours and hours of data, it shows up as red for sure. And then my, one of my favorite uh, images uh, to take is the Trifid, again in Sagittarius. It's around 5,000 light years away. Uh, and uh, what you're looking at here, the red is, uh, again, ionized hydrogen glowing uh, like a Coke can. And the blue is actually a reflection nebula. It's not glowing at all. It's reflected light from the, t from the stars nearby. And the reason we see it as blue is that dust selectively uh, reflects uh, blue light. Same reason we see a blue sky, sunlight going through the sky above us, it, the blue is scattered and we see the blue light being scattered. So you're looking at basically sky in the sky. Thank you very much. Thanks, Bob. Uh, up next, we've got Taras. I had a short vacation at the end of May, and I wanted to use it for a trip to Florida. And it coincided that uh, there was an Alberto hurricane passing through that region. So last night before the trip, I had to reconsider, replan it. And instead, I, so I looked it up on the map, the dark place, some, some somewhat elevated place, and uh, uh, open for public, more or less, was a campground called Mulberry Mountain in uh, Arkansas, the United States. Um, it's, um, I take some planetary pictures there. The site is located in the northwest corner of the state uh, on a light pollution map. It's dark gray, and uh, it has an elevation about 1,300 feet, which would provide for good seeing. Uh, the place is very picturesque. This picture was taken just a few kilometers away from the actual campground from a lookout. That's part of the scenic route, so that area is quite beautiful. And uh, that's my setup. So the campground is pretty flat, wide open, well maintained. And um, I set up equipment so that I had a wide, unobstructed view of the entire sky. The weather was beautiful for the first two nights, with good seeing and little clouds. But later, that storm uh, coming from the south made me leave the place and uh, one, one day earlier than I planned. I actually had to run away from it and pretty fast. So this is my setup. Um, I used 8-inch Schmidt Cass telescope with a GSO dual speed focuser with a filter wheel with the LRGB Vader filters and uh, two times Teleview Barlow lens and the Rising Tech 
planetary camera similar to what um, uh, Jim mentioned, he was using 2.9, in this case, a pixel size camera, pretty sensitive, but it's monochrome, thus the filter wheel. Um, the main purpose was planetary imaging, but um, I didn't worry that the moon was actually approaching its full face. So for that, I was awarded a beautiful view of the night scenery from the moon and occasional clouds being part of it. What well, was quite unusual was to see that, uh, in fact, clouds were moving very low and fast. So sometimes it looked like I can reach them. They were so low. And um, moon shining through them was casting these volumetric shadows and cones of light. And the scenery was breathtaking. Jupiter was pretty high uh, at that latitude and very close to the moon. That's actually Jupiter. And uh, the campground itself uh, wasn't bothering me when there were people. I, I practically didn't see them nor hear. There is a very little light pollution coming from uh, campground in the woods. So I was left alone by myself. Um, seeing, as I mentioned, was pretty good. So uh, I took, I started with the moon. It was a picture of the moon taken with the same camera. And um, uh, it's stacked, same idea. It's a video with uh, some percentage of best frames selected. But when I started, um, so this is actually equivalent of 600 times magnification. It's on the brink of my scope's resolution. Uh, the good seeing made it possible to resolve some smaller details on the surface. In particular, I was surprised to find out that uh, this wrinkle here was resolved. And um, it's uh, later on, I looked it up. I wanted to know what it is. It's on the edge of Mare Humorum. And uh, apparently, uh, these types of groups are called ri rills, if I, re if, if I pronounce it right. Um, this one bisects a crater over here. The crater is called Hippolus. Uh, it's actually a remnant of, of the crater. There's only three quarters of it left. And uh, that um, rill belongs to Rime Hippolus. It follows the course from the south before curving gently into the southwest for a total length of uh, 240 kilometers. So I estimated that this width might be about two kilometers for that uh, rail. Jupiter, I always had a bad luck trying to see the red spot, but uh, luckily uh, that night, the first of the two nights, uh, the red spot was facing me, so I took this picture. Um, it was decent seeing, uh, not uh, really uh, as good as it would have been in Florida, but much better than in our latitudes. Next night, though, it was much better, and. Uh, I resolved some smaller details on Jupiter and one of the moons, so I was pretty happy with this result. And again, there is a little bit of a uh, red spot showing up here. Mars uh, was up in the skies again, uh, so there are actually four planets visible uh, that night. And uh, uh, this was before the storm, uh, sandstorm kicked in, it was uh, to be specific, May 29th. And uh, I was happy to see that uh, some details on the Mars showed up, definitely the details in the polar cap. I think this might be like a atmospheric, maybe cloud or so, and uh, the surface details. Just for comparison, this is uh, Mars when um, it was closest approach to Earth, but actually two months after that. So about uh, mid of August when this picture was taken. This is taken actually from uh, a fellow observatory. And uh, uh, to compare the size, I uh, decided to show how much it changed in size compared to the one from the trip. Oops. Just gotta, yeah, now you should be okay. Mm -hmm. Thanks. You gotta wait for the text to disappear, unfortunately. It's okay. Oh, there you go. So this is Saturn. Um, seeing, as I said, was, oops. oops. Go ahead and go back one. Yeah, I, Chris, can you fix it? 
there you go. So um, again, the, when, when, I, when I was taking this video, it's a combination of uh, L, R, G, B, uh, four separate videos taken for each channel. And the scene was so good that each frame of each channel, when I was taking it, they did contain the Cassini division, clearly seen, complete size, in all of them, so I was pretty happy about that. And it's one of those moments when you, <coughs> first you look at it with your own eye, and uh, this is the, that wow factor that uh, your, your jaw drops. This is uh, Venus, which was actually one of the main goals, and uh, main targets for the trip. But um, um, I used a UV filter for Venus clouds. It's about 350 nanometer band frequency, which it allows to get through while blocking everything else. So with Venus, the thing is that it's covered with such a thick layer of such a reflective clouds that it reflects about 90% of sunlight, sunlight shining on it. So when we look at it, it looks just like a orangey, shining blob, but not more than that. We cannot see much of the details. So with, ha with the help of that filter, which helps to increase the contrast of that light being, uh, inf uh, uh, being reflected from, uh, from the sun, it allows a little bit of some particular in, um, UV frequency to get through. And uh, this is a combination of that UV frequency being added, because wh when you take a picture in UV, it turns out black and white, so I added that black and white um, map to the blue color to make it look a little bit kind of uh, eerie because of uh, the uh, consistency of the clouds, which is uh, uh, the um, sulfuric acid that the clouds consist of. Thank you. Is it possible to sharpen the image? Uh, it is already sharpened to practically whatever I could squeeze out of it. The thing is that uh, despite that I was praising the scene, the original material was not that sharp at all. So uh, to increase the, sh uh, the, the contrast and the, the details, I used um, wavelet algorithms. And uh, they do a little bit of a sharpening. I, on the other hand, I didn't want to overdo that because otherwise it would not be a really truthful image. But um, this particular, I was happy to see that actually there is a little bit of details in those clouds here. You can see the, the main band of the cloud. Usually there are like V-shaped clouds and I have a few pictures from the trip like that, but this particular one, uh, you can see like a three distinct bands uh, closer to the both poles. Thank you. All right, thank you, Taras. Uh, up next, uh, we've got Paul. trust you. <laughs> All right. Well, good evening, everybody. i uh, got a few things for you tonight. Uh, as Oscar mentioned, I, I was down at Starfest. I was invited to talk about uh, imaging comets, and uh, I thought it might be appropriate to uh, take a little side trip. So we didn't take the most direct route to, to Starfest, and uh, we decided to visit Brent Crater, which I know Chuck has uh, talked about in the, in the past there. For those of you not familiar with Brent, uh, this is a very old uh, impact site uh, in the northern boundary, near the northern boundary of Algonquin Park. It's, uh, it's, an, it's, an interesting, uh, it's an interesting formation, especially when you become aware of, of the history. So the, the, the crater here is very old. It's, uh, it's estimated that the impact that caused this uh, occurred about 450 million years ago. And uh, it's, it's certainly in the Canadian Shield, a uh, very tough uh, very durable rock, and so the, it, this this uh, this feature hasn't been eroded completely over time. Instead, it's been filled in with a lot of sediments and rubble. Especially, we've had four four at least four major glaciations and uh, all sorts of rubble filling it up. But when the impact occurred, we were talking about an object that's pr probably about the a little bit maybe bigger than a size of a football field, an asteroid. Um, so about 150 meters across. Uh, smacking into the ground at probably around 20 kilometers a second. So you can imagine the force. Uh, it carved out this crater, the original crater, about three kilometers in diameter. And uh, that must have been a truly bad hair day, even for somebody like me. <laughs> because 
in an instant, in less than a second, uh, that impact excavated a billion tons of, of rock and turned it into this molten shower of debris that went every which way. Uh, it's been estimated that the, that the magnitude, the energy released in this impact uh, is equivalent to about 250 megatons uh, of TNT. So to put that in perspective, the, the, the most powerful uh, hydrogen bomb man has ever detonated is about 50, million, uh, 50 megatons, so about five times greater than, than our most powerful H-bomb. Um, that being said, if that occurred today, every tree in Algonquin and for quite a ways beyond Algonquin would be totally flattened. Uh, apparently the shock wave would shatter most of the windows in Ottawa and just the just the rumble through the ground would probably damage or bring down most of the buildings. So yeah, not, not, a, not a good scenario. It's good that it happened 450 million years ago. So we wanted to go and see this because it, it is an interesting site. It's not, a, as I said, directly on the way to Starfest, but uh, uh, I like exploring. So we, uh, we checked it out. Uh, the, the, uh, you can drive down this. It comes off the Trans-Canada. There's the Brent Road, which is a dirt road. It does about 32 kilometers of, of, of fairly well-maintained dirt road, if you're interested in ever going to see this. Um, just before you turn off, just before you reach uh, North Bay, actually. And uh, there's an observation tower just near the uh, rim of the crater. And if you go further on down towards Cedar Lake, uh, there's campground. You can book a campground site there, which is what we did uh, the night before we went to Starfest. So, oops, at the observation tower, if I can go back one, uh, we're all we're all button challenged tonight. So this is this is the view of the crater from from the uh, observation tower. Uh, it's it's an elevated structure, <coughs> excuse me, that they built a, a number of years ago. Um, and uh, it just, it's t just tall enough so that you can see over the tops of the trees uh, that are basically sitting on the rim, part of the rim closest to you. The distant terrain there that you see is the rim on the far side, about three kilometers away. And there's a hill in the middle, which uh, is, is not like a central peak, it's just debris that's been chucked in there. Uh, no, no offense, Chuck. But uh, <laughs> debris that's been washed in over, over the eons there and, and built up because this area has also been submerged uh, under, under, uh, under uh, ancient seas uh, probably a number of times. But uh, when this was discovered in 1951, it was, uh, it was uh, quite exciting because it, uh, it, was, it was at a time when we were, uh, we were starting to explore these impact, potential impact features in, in Canada. And uh, they had just uh, done some work up in the New Quebec, uh, the Chubb Crater, in, in far northern Quebec. And uh, this was discovered on, a, on an aerial photograph uh, as a circular feature, so, and it was much closer to Ottawa. And, uh, and uh, so there was a, a lot of work done to see if this, if this was, in fact, an impact structure. And uh, so they, they, from this central mound here, they actually drilled down. Uh, over a kilometer to collect core samples to, to extract rock from the from the overlying rubble, and uh, sure enough, they found uh, evidence that uh, that pointed to what was most likely a, 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 an impact feature. So three kilometers across and about 600 meters deep was the original crater there, and uh, yeah, that must have been a, a, an interesting day. Uh, from the observation post, there's a, you can see just barely Tecumseh Lake here. And there's another lake on the other side of the hill which you cannot see. This is again just filled in uh, from uh, from from water over the over the intervening years. So if you get a chance to see this, it's it's uh, it's quite an interesting structure. Um, it's very old. It's not like the the uh, the the um, Behringer crater in in Arizona, which is very very recent in comparison. It is very old, 400 million years, and uh, it. Uh, but you can definitely see that there's a, there's something uh, of interest there. So we, we checked that out, and then we also went down to encamped at the campsite there. We had not a bad evening. Um, it was clear for a little while there, but it was, uh, there was a lot of mist on, the, on, the, uh, on Cedar Lake. Uh, still got, uh, got a nice view of the Milky Way. You can see the clouds starting to roll in. And you can see how there's, there's Mars there, and this is uh, Saturn. You can see how they look kind of fuzzy. As, as it turns out, uh, there was a lot of ground mist there, which we didn't see until we did some uh, light painting. So we just shone a very powerful flashlight over the surface of the lake there, and you can see the mist uh, rising up there, giving the uh, 
giving the glow on to the uh, to 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 the uh, planets and and to the brighter stars there. But uh, I, I love the fact that you could see Mars's reflection in the lake. That was really cool. So an interesting place. Very dark skies. Uh, so if, and and the campgrounds are are decent. There's not that many of them. So if you are interested at some point. Uh, you, you, you'd be advised to book ahead there, but it's an interesting place to explore. And there's also, uh, I should mention, for the for the actual crater site, uh, there's a trail that goes down to Tecumseh Lake, which you can follow through that gets you get you down and in, into the central part of the of the of the feature there. So uh, yeah, re really a uh, really interesting area to explore. All right, onward and upward to uh, Starfest. Starfest was uh, was good this year. It was uh, it was. Um, we had we had four clear nights. Uh, some were better than others. Certainly, two of them were were quite exquisite, and we had a heck of a display of the of the Perseids. There were a couple of nights there where uh, uh, very very late into the evening and three and three a.m. and stuff, we we got bursts of of, of these meteors, uh, and you can see a, a number of them here. And obviously, one of these is different than the others. <laughs> that guy there, obviously not a Perseid, but uh, bright enough. Uh, certainly to, to, to register on the camera and take note. And uh, Mars showing right down here. I should have aimed the camera a little bit lower because that's Saturn right down, right down at the edge of the frame, Saturn and Mars. But uh, yeah, some, some very nice bright uh, Perseids and, uh, and the sky was very accommodating. So uh, it, was, it was interesting. There's actually another, I don't know if you can see this very well, but there's another faint meteor there which uh, Judging from the trail is also not uh, associated with the Perseids, which are all coming from the radiant and, and share a, a similar trajectory. So uh, this this is just a 16 millimeter lens, uh, 20 second exposures. I was just shooting them off uh, uh, all night there to try to capture a few meters, and this is a this is a composite of a, a number of the best ones that I caught there. So yeah, good 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 uh, good uh, time this year at at the um, at Starfest there. And as I mentioned, I was invited to, to give a, an image uh, or a, a lecture down there on uh, imaging comets because this year is a, is a, is a good year for us. Um, as Dave mentioned uh, in, in, his, in his opening segment, we have a comet right now, uh, Jacobini Zinner, more affectionately known as 21P, it's a little easier, uh, that's, uh, that's observable right now. And I'm really glad I had this opportunity to talk to you tonight because for those of you interested in seeing this comet, it's an easy target with binoculars. Uh, it's currently at around eh, magnitude seven, and I've heard estimates as, as, as high as uh, maybe 6.5-ish. So not quite naked eye visibility, but near the threshold. I, I've been viewing this, I've actually been imaging this, this comet. Here, I'll give it to you there. I've actually been looking at this comet since about uh, late May. I imaged it then. I didn't include that image because it's just a real smudge at that time. It was about 12th magnitude, but it's in, it's uh, it's coming close to the sun. In fact, it reaches perihelion in three days, and so it's it's as bright as it's going to get. And we have the potential for a good night tonight and a good night tomorrow. There's a star party going on tomorrow. So if you'd like to see this, it's very pretty e even in a small telescope. Or in binoculars, it's it's quite obvious, and it's just uh, it's just a little bit away from Capella there. Uh, if if maybe we can throw up the map later on, uh, if, if for those of you that are interested, but you can certainly Google it and, and find the position of this. It's uh, it's quite visible. This is one of two really. There's there's several comets that are that are inbound or or, or have been. Uh, this is this is the second best one. Uh, and I'll talk about the other one um, in, the, in, the, in the months to come because after the new year, we have the potential of a comet coming to magnitude three, which is easy naked eye visibility. And uh, so that uh, it's, it's, it's very faint right now. I imaged it not too long ago and it's down at around, I don't know, again, about 14th magnitude. It's just a little speck, but it's, it's, it's approaching and in the next few months, it'll. Uh, it should shine up. If it, if it lives up to expectations, it could be one of the brightest comets that we've had in, in several years. So uh, this, is a good, uh, this is a good prelude for it, uh, Jacobini Zinner. And uh, what I did, th I shot this, um, I shot this uh, about uh, 18 days ago. And uh, this is with uh, my 11-inch scope and, um, and uh, a Canon 60DA. And what I did is, uh, one of the problems with imaging comets is that they move. 
in the course of the night. In fact, if you're, if you're out tonight or tomorrow night to, to see this thing, uh, you'll notice if you look at it periodically during the course of the evening and take note of the stars that it's nearby, you'll notice the movement because it's, it's quite obvious. And when you're, doing, and when you're shooting it with a, with a telescope, that becomes even more apparent because you're using a lot of magnification to, to see this thing. So uh, I, I keep the exposures really short and uh, to try to minimize the, the drag because my uh, auto guider isn't, isn't sensitive enough most of the time to pick up on a comet like this. I have to guide on one of the nearby stars and if I guide on the stars that means the comet's going to drift if I, let it, uh, if I let the exposure go too long. So I take a lot of short exposures and what I do is essentially separate the comet from the stars, stack them individually and then put them back together. A little bit of work there but it's worth it and it allows me to do this next thing, which is a time lapse. So I've got a time lapse here lasts for about three whole seconds, uh, but it's a compression of about 65 minutes of this comet's motion uh, on that night uh, 18 nights ago. So I'll see if I can roll that. So yeah, that's uh, you can see that that's just over an hour of uh, of its of its motion through the sky. So obviously, even a five-minute exposure or something like that, if you're not guiding on the comet's nucleus itself would just, uh, would just become a smear. Just a question, is that a tail of the comet on the right-hand side? It most certainly is. Yep. It is. So that was 18 days ago. That comet has brightened by about uh, almost a, a full magnitude since then. As I say, it's uh, about maybe, maybe half a magnitude to a full magnitude, depending on whose estimates you believe. Um, and I shot this next one just three nights ago. So that last one was with an 11-inch telescope. This is an image with a 500-millimeter uh, lens. And interestingly, the, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to give a, a, a summary of this lens. This is one that, that's caught a few of our interests there. Terrace actually started the ball rolling on this uh, earlier this year when he saw this advert for a 500 millimeter f6.3 catadioptric lens for about 120 bucks and I'm thinking okay how good is that going to be uh, but nevertheless uh, about three other people that I know including myself uh, bought this lens and uh, it can actually take some half decent images I was I was actually pleasantly surprised so that was with that lens next month or, or if, if, if the schedule is too packed the month following I'll give a synopsis of that lens because for any of you that, that peruse astronomy equipment websites, and I'm sure there's one or two of you up there, you've probably seen the ads for these little cataractic uh, lenses pop up on your screen there. And uh, yeah, they can be surprisingly good, but there are some caveats to their use there. So if you've, if you've seen that and you, you've, you've had your interest peaked, um, stay tuned. Uh, I'll, try to, I'll try to do that summary for, our, for you. Uh, next month there before you drop your coin on it. It's for 120 bucks, I'll give you the spoiler now. It's, 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 it's a, an interesting lens to play with there, but there are definitely limitations to its use. Do you know what star it is? Uh, it's very near Capella. It's, uh, uh, it's, in fact, if you, if you look at the, uh, any star map uh, in, uh, and turn your binoculars to Auriga, it's in that, it's in that polygon that forms Auriga. Uh, and if you're more familiar with stars, uh, between Capella and El Nath, which is, at, uh, which is one of the uh, stars at the end of the horns of Taurus, it's about halfway in between. And that's my last image. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, uh, yeah, stay tuned on that one. It's, a, it's an interesting object, but, but do it tonight or tomorrow night because otherwise uh, it reaches perihelion and you're going to lose it uh, after two days. All right. Thank you, Paul. Uh, we've got Gordon next, a uh, yep. couple of images. Yeah. Alrighty, I headed out to FLO at the beginning of August, the Perseids weekend, and uh, this is taken with my Canon 70D on my iopton Sky Tracker Pro with a 10 to 20 millimeter lens. I think it was probably about 10 or 12 millimeters. Um, and so I caught a couple of things and which we can sort of, I caught a little Perseid. Nice view of Andromeda. And we were looking a couple of nights ago in here somewhere is the comet that we were 
we've all been talking about this evening. It is visible as a small little cluster of green pixels. Um, if you can find it, that would be great. <laughs> Thank you, Gordon. All right, uh, it's me next. Uh, so I think back in May, I showed you guys this image. Uh, I also showed it last month. Um, this is the Leo triplet. Uh, so last month I showed, so this was taken with an 80 millimeter uh, apochromatic refractor. Uh, and last month I showed uh, a close up of this galaxy there, M66, that was taken with my 11 inch edge. Uh, so this month, I've turned uh, my eyes on NGC 3628, this guy there, uh, with the 11 inch Edge HD. Um, so that's about three and a half hours of exposure, uh, combination of 10 minutes of exposures and five minutes of exposures uh, with a Canon 60DA. Uh, so that's a spiral galaxy. Um, it is classified as an unbarred spiral galaxy, but there are some thoughts that it is barred given sort of this X bulge uh, that it, that it uh, displays. I, I captured that in the image, which I thought was kind of cool. All right, and uh, next we've got a couple submissions by Roman uh, Dizioba. Uh, so he took these from Iqaluit. Uh, so he captured a couple sun dogs there. Um, and I'm not sure what this phenomenon is there. Does anybody know? Uh, and then he also captured this reflection there. So he took these with his cell phone camera, which I thought was kind of cool. All right, observing challenge time. So last month uh, I asked folks to observe M57, which no one submitted. But we did see a submission for NGC 6572 from Bob, uh, Palomar 11 also from Bob, and uh, Jim had the uh, Clavius Cradle, so thanks for participating in that, guys. Uh, this month, our beginner challenge is going to be M27. Um, so it's a planetary nebula in Vulpecula, and it's ad right ad adjacent to Sagitta. Eighth magnitude, visible in small scopes, should be a fairly easy target. Our intermediate challenge is going to be NGC 6946, uh, the fireworks galaxy, uh, which is a spiral galaxy in Cepheus, 9.6 apparent magnitude. Um, and our advanced challenge will be NGC 6196, which is a galaxy in, in Hercules, uh, and it's just southwest of M13, 13.9 uh, magnitude. Uh, for our lunar challenge, uh, Rupus Recta, or the straight wall, uh, which is best visible on lunars day 8 and 22. Uh, so that's it right there. Uh, it's located in Mare Nubium. All right, so to summarize, that's M27 for the beginner challenge, uh, NGC 6946 for intermediate. Our advanced challenge is NGC 6196, and our lunar challenge is Rupus Recta. So it'd be cool if we could see some submissions of those next month. All right, FLO uh, star parties. For members only, the next one is September 8th, which is tomorrow. Uh, I think the weather's looking good for tomorrow, last time I checked. Yes? Oh, yes, okay, I'm told it's, it's been relocated to Plevna, to the, uh, the Plevna observing platform there. Uh, so contact, uh, talk to Gordon there if you don't know where that site is and to, uh, to, to get all the details. Um, public star parties, are, we usually hold them um, at the cart branch of the Ottawa Public Library, just in the parking lot uh, adjacent to the Diefen bunker. Uh, the next one is uh, tomorrow uh, with rain dates of the 14th and the 15th. And uh, the October dates are uh, the, sixth, uh, the 5th of October, which is actually going to be a star party uh, here at, at the museum that's being hosted by, by CASM and that we're helping 
to uh, to host. So it'll be a short a short program for the meeting and uh, and star party, uh, probably behind the hangar, uh, weather permitting. Uh, and the sixth is at Luskville. There's a, that that star party is happening at Luskville. The fifth of October. Estelle's pick of the month is Einstein's Unfinished Symphony. Thank you, Estelle, for picking that out. These are the folks that uh, keep this well-oiled machine running. So thank you for uh, for your assistance. Our uh, meetings uh, are available to view later. They are recorded and posted on our website. We had an audience of 76 today. Thank you for coming out. Uh, thank you to all the speakers and volunteers. Our uh, post-meeting meeting will be at Grace O'Malley's uh, at uh, uh, Ogilvy and the Aviation Parkway. Our next meeting is uh, fr uh, Friday, October 5th at 7.30. Uh, this is another meeting where we're sort of breaking from our tradition of staying away from, from holiday weekends. Uh, this is the uh, Thanksgiving long weekend. Uh, so it will be held on that weekend. Uh, membership benefits, you get access to the Ted Bean Lone Library, the Stanmott Book Library, and the FLO uh, by joining the club if you haven't already. And uh, also access to these exciting publications. No door prizes tonight because I goofed, so apologies. And uh, and again, reminder that the uh, next meeting is October fifth. Thank you very much, and uh, see you next month.